Hello and welcome to this webinar organized by IDANAP uh, in during the Open Education Week uh, uh, series of webinars organized by Eden 2021. I, st I see that people have already uh, started to present themselves, which is very uh, good. And I'm uh, encouraging you to present yourself and introduce yourself and your uh, maybe institution or city or country in the chat section. And uh, when you are going to have questions for our distinguished speakers, to use the Q&A section. Again, welcome uh, uh, everyone who is attending both on Zoom and on uh, our YouTube channel. It is very uh, uh, nice to see uh, we have a good uh, audience and interest in, uh, in this topic uh, about uh, digital culture and uh, the uh, various online educational courses for the creative industry sector. Uh, my name is Vlad Mikhaescu. I am the chair of the EDEN uh, NAP Steering Committee. That means the EDEN Network of Academics and Professionals. And uh, I am going to be uh, one of the moderators today, together with my colleague uh, Alfredo Soeiro from uh, University uh, of Porto. And uh, I'm very uh, honored that he accepted to, to join me as the moderator today. Uh, especially since he's been uh, very close to the to the IDENAP uh, steering committee for, for some years now. So I, I see we already have people from uh, Poland, from Spain, from uh, Canada, from Romania, uh, Sweden, Portugal, Romania, Croatia, and I'm sorry if uh, maybe I uh, uh, missed uh, some of the countries, uh, and I'm happy to, to see that the numbers are uh, still rising in the participants uh, area. Uh, so, as I said, our webinar is related to the cultural sector and uh, the various courses which can help this sector. As uh, most of you know uh, and saw, uh, together with the tourist area, tourist sector, the cultural and creative areas uh, have been uh, very um, affected by this crisis, this COVID pandemic, and uh, there is a very a large number of, uh, of a percentage of, of uh, people who are in risk of losing their jobs, many already did. Uh, unfortunately, the effects can be uh, long lasting because there are many uh, factors related to a uh, drop in, uh, in uh, the purchasing power, the, the drop in, uh, in tourism, and uh, also uh, the, the reductions in uh, public funding for culture because now um, um, there are other uh, areas of uh, emergency where, where uh, public funding is needed. Uh, this crisis has uh, shown the, that the sector, uh, the cultural sector can be quite fragile and that there, there, is, um, there are not so many uh, public support schemes for the creative industries, uh, in, in, especially in terms of uh, forms of employment. Um, however, uh, we also saw that there was a big innovation uh, and uh, uh, an, uh, an increase in the digitization, digitalization of creative industries. We saw a lot of events that moved into the online and uh, creativity has been uh, again uh, the savior of this industry. Uh, there are many crossovers, especially between culture and education now. And uh, this is one of the uh, main reasons which we chose to do this, uh, this webinar. And uh, uh, the hope for the future is that after this period finishes, there will be a very large opportunity for uh, uh, creative industries to reinvent themselves and uh, be reborn, so to speak, from, uh, from this, uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this difficult period. Uh, so I want to uh, pass now the, the microphone to my colleague Alfredo to present uh, the topic of, uh, of this uh, webinar and to introduce uh, our first speaker. Thank you, Alfredo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and very glad to be here. It's, uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, session. We have um, uh, a topic that uh, it's not usually tackled in this kind of session, so I think uh, it would be interesting to hear our speakers and then the debate. So. I'll start by uh, introducing um, the first speaker, Dr. Diana Andon. She's uh, Eden Vice President for Communication and Communities of Practice 
and also director of the Learning Center at the Polytechnic University of Timisoara in Romania. I hope you pronounce it right. But um, um, we will like to hear what you have to say and uh, you have uh, more information about uh, Dr. Diana and Don in the Eden website. So Diana, please. Thank you very much, uh, Alfredo, for this. It's very nice to see you and to see everyone around here. I will start sharing my screen uh, and uh, hopefully I will be able to say something about uh, the interesting things which we are doing now in the area of, uh, of digital competencies and to creative industries and into culture. And uh, in this uh, moment, hopefully everything is going to be fine. So um, I'm coming from the Polytechnic University of Timisoara. I'm also an Eden vice president. And this presentation is part of the Open Education Week and uh, also at, uh, of the DigiCulture project, which we uh, also join. And I'm calling with Vlad Mihaescu, and we are working both of us into this project. So something about Digital Culture Project, it is a project funded by the European Union through the Erasmus Plus uh, Fund. And it's, the idea is to improve digital competencies and social inclusion of the adults in the area of creative industries through a series of uh, courses, open educational resources, and also support. My university is a very large university in the west corner of Romania, in Timisoara, in a city which is going to be in 2023 European capital of culture. And this is the main idea why we wanted very much to train into digital competencies all the cultural and creative industries stakeholders here in our west Romania. What is creative industry? I'm pretty much aware that everybody knows about them, but very briefly, I wanted to mention them. So it's also advertising and marketing, mass media, but also culture, arts, uh, film, uh, television, museum, galleries, libraries, and a lot of performing arts. We also think a lot about the creative creators. It's a lot of research started with Friedman back in 2008, and we have done several research since 20, uh, 2012 uh, about the creative creators, those which are able to use creativity and use strategic uh, approach to creativity as to enhance also uh, their lives, their, um, how to say, product, what they are doing, their companies, their institutions, and everything around them uh, by knowledge sharing with uh, the support of technology and also adding the extra touch of the creativity. We are looking at the digital competencies from the point of view of the European Union, the famous DICOM 2.1. I will not insist over it. All of our courses are looking at the eight digital competencies and we've done extensive research on, into to find out what is exactly needed into the digital competencies as to be able to uh, ask uh, and to find uh, the right courses and the right technologies and tools and application to support the creative industries to learn about them. This is the famous swimmer and I will leave now my colleagues from the DigiCulture project to say something to you.
Yes, these were the courses which we introduced through the DigiCulture project, which are all online free courses available on digiculture.eu. And we kindly ask you to go and join our courses. About four or five of them are ready now, so you can have a look and also start uh, learning about uh, digital competencies for digiculture. And uh, obviously, the topics, more topics will become uh, available in the incoming weeks. So looking very much forward to, to see you there online. The courses are based in on a lot of open educational resources, on best practices, on examples and study cases coming from culture and technology, from the different digital artists with whom we are working and several study other cases. It's a, the web interface where you can go and uh, find some more information about the courses is digiculture.eu. And from that point onward, you are also able to join the, the courses. The, at the end of all the, the courses, after you finish the activities and you completed the tasks which are provided to you into the course, you will be able to earn a badge. The badge, the open badge is a, a digital certificate, which is validated through Eden and other associations like Culture Action Europe also. And you will be able to share that in uh, different other social media platforms and also to uh, print it because we in, developed a several models of certificates, which you can also save and print. And these are the all badges which you are able to gain if you are joining each course. Each course is an independent course. You can join them separately, not necessarily in a, server, in a certain order. And here are several videos. You will have the presentation from where you can see some course demos and different other information. This project is followed now by another project uh, funded also by the European Union through the Erasmus Plus project, which is looking at how to enable open training on creative and cultural entrepreneurship, which is called TRACE, where our university is joining other universities from Europe in trying to develop a new approach to cultural entrepreneurship. And also another one, which is looking at the augmented reality introduced into culture and into engineering education. So we are trying very much to approach the STEAM which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math with augmented uh, reality technologies. Recently, we have finalized another study case on digital culture by producing the famous the Romanian sculpture, Peter Yeza Digital Museum with several virtual tours around the museums and information. This is the university, the Technical University from Timisoara uh, Museum, where we also produce uh, virtual tours and information about how the first computers were built in Romania back in the 60s. A project which is very dear to us is developed with the Timisoara European Capital of Culture Association and funded through the uh, mayor of Timisoara and also the Romanian Cultural Ministry, which is Spotlight Heritage, which is telling in a digital story of different uh, uh, neighborhoods of Timisoara on different layers, which are also a mobile application with augmented reality, a very powerful website, which has also the historical and architectural story of the city, but add it with the personal stories of the people from the past, very famous people in some cases, and also the actual stories told by the youngsters from Timisoara. And uh, these are the, this is also the mobile application and the augmented reality application. This is the team which is developing all of this uh, project and you have here my contact details. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I think we'll have the questions at the end. So I'll start with the, the introduction of the second speaker, which I know from working with him in the internet on the Musa project, but I never met him <laughs> even on a video conference. But uh, it's Dr. Achilles Kameas, um, is a professor of Pervasive and Global Computing Systems at the Lechnik Open University. And I'll give the floor to Dr. 
Achilles Camers. Um, and uh, uh, we are looking forward to hear your presentation. Uh, good evening, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you for having me in this uh, in this uh, workshop, uh, in this event. Uh, I am going to. Uh, okay, I managed to do that. Uh, I am going to present you uh, two, actually, to give you two presentations. Uh, uh, one, uh, two short presentations. One will be about uh, the Musa project uh, uh, that you already uh, heard of. Um, and this is one of a very important project that we uh, concluded uh, about, uh, uh, well, less than a year ago. Um, it, it, it aimed at uh, training uh, museum professionals into uh, digital, uh, into uh, helping them acquire digital competencies. And then I will uh, say a few words about some other projects that we are uh, currently running with my group. So I'll start with the Musa project. Uh, um, the Musa project targeted the museum professionals and uh, the, uh, our aim goes to uh, facilitate them into acquiring uh, uh, digital competencies. We designed new uh, four emerging job role uh, profiles and for each profile we decided a training curriculum and then we implemented a three-stage training course for each of the profiles using uh, online training course. Uh, we used uh, the first stage was composed of a MOOC and uh, the second stage uh, contained uh, e-learning, uh, blended learning, and the third stage was uh, workplace learning. Uh, in our project, we combined um, frameworks for, of digital competencies like Digicomp that you uh, was already mentioned in the previous presentation, but also ECF. And we set up communities of practice in each country who are still active even one year after the end uh, of the project. So. In the first stages of this project, we uh, identify, we uh, made um, extensive research with uh, museum professionals, museum directors, and other stakeholders. Uh, we identified four emerging job role profiles that uh, now describe new roles in contemporary museums, like the digital strategy manager, the digital collections curator, interactive experience developer, and an online community manager. As you can see, all of them have important digital um, dimensions, let's say, and uh, we describe these profiles using a combination of digital skills and transferable skills. Um, and uh, then we uh, focused on offering, on training uh, the museum professionals into acquiring the competencies that were uh, described in these profiles. As I said, the first stage contained a MOOC on essential skills for museum professionals that we developed in the project. And then in the second stage contained four specialization courses, one of each profile. The MOOC combined the, let's say, common competencies for all the profiles. We're talking about digital and transferable competencies here. And in the specialization courses, we had allocated more specific uh, competencies, again, digital and transferable, uh, that were more related to each of the profiles. Uh, so, um, the, the duration of the MOOC was eight weeks and uh, in total eight hours uh, of learning, we required eight hours of learning. We taught 22 competencies uh, coming from ECF, Digicomp, uh, and uh, 21st century skill, the transversal competencies. Uh, while for the specialization courses, um, there were uh, four courses running in parallel, uh, in total 42 competencies in all of them. Uh, again, the same combination and uh, the, the entire duration of the specialization courses, including the work-based learning, was six months. So in total, the training, uh, the whole training lasted about one year. Uh, here is uh, uh, the structure of, of the MOOC, and you can see the competencies. Um, each week we had uh, one ECF competence and uh, one or two digitum, Digicom or transferable competencies. Uh, we uh, follow we decided to follow these frameworks. Uh, ECF is a standard digital business framework so that uh, whatever um, competencies were acquired was, uh, from the, by the museum professionals, they could be recognized and they could be maintained uh, in the future. Um, for example, uh, we have uh, competencies like uh, information system and business strategy alignment, uh, business plan development, uh, technology trend, trend monitoring, uh, innovating, 
needs identification, forecast development and relationship management and quality management coming from ECF and then some competencies coming from Digicom like, uh, the, the, let's say, first ones, browsing, searching and filtering data information and digital content and then managing again data information and digital content. And then a bit more advanced ones um, like uh, innovating and creatively using technology or um, collaborating through digital technologies and of course some competencies coming from the transversal uh, set of, let's uh, for example team working or creative thinking or um, leadership and so on and uh, then in the specialization courses again we had a similar structure uh, based on weeks and each week um, in each week we taught uh, a combination of competencies again as you see there are ECF, Digicom, and transversal competencies in each week. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, this is the first slide, and this is the second slide of the contents of, uh, of the training. Uh, and we, um, as we see, it, towards the end, there were many transferable competencies like interpersonal skills, networking, negotiation, active listening, resilience, mediation, storytelling. All of this important for uh, different... Uh, uh, for the different profiles of museum uh, uh, professionals. I repeat that this is the complete set of competencies, but these competencies were not taught to all the profiles. We had divided them per profile. Uh, we did this, uh, we did the training uh, through our uh, dedicated MOOC server that we have, um, we are maintaining with uh, our research group. And um, the structure of the MOOC was uh, based on the weeks, as uh, I showed you before. And uh, for each uh, for each week, there were uh, units. Each week contained units uh, of uh, teaching material, uh, and the units contained learning objects, uh, videos, presentations, uh, text to be studied, and so on. For each uh, module and for each unit, we had. Uh, clearly set learning outcomes in the beginning so that the trainees could uh, know what they were going to learn during this um, module or this week. And then at the end, there was, a, there was an assessment test, as you can see here, uh, that led to uh, an online badge. And uh, those people, there were some com um, success cr criteria to complete the MOOC. <clears throat> uh, and uh, you can see that... Uh, uh, the MOOC created a huge interest. We had uh, more than uh, 5,000 uh, expressions of interest, more than 3,000, almost 4,000 people enrolled in the MOOC, and uh, about 1,300 finished it successfully, and the participants came from all these countries. Uh, I mean, the, part, the consortium uh, came, uh, the partners of the consortium came from Italy, Greece, and Portugal, but and one partner from Belgium, but the participants in the MOOC came from all over the world. And some of them then continued in the specialization to the specialization courses. The platform was a different one, but using the same look and feel so that there was a short learning curve. Here, uh, the, the trainees should, had to select the profile they wanted to follow, the path they wanted to follow, and then Again, there was the same structure uh, uh, based on weeks. Each week contained modules. Each module was br is broken down into units, and each unit is made up of learning objects. And at the end of each unit, there is a, uh, an assessment test. Um, and finally, there were practical assignments uh, that uh, supported the workplace learning. Uh, and this took place in museums that uh, and other cultural organizations with uh, which with whom we were collaborating during uh, during the project. Um, in the second stage, there were about 120 candidates that uh, took place in the three participating countries. This was a restriction that was put in place by the funding agency, and 80% of them were already working in museums, while 20% of them were not working. So we also supported people who wanted to join the labor market, let's say. Uh, the learning effort, okay, I don't want to go into details here, just to show you the overall that for each um, profile, there were about uh, 450, 470 uh, learning hours, uh, combining the MOOC, the specialization course, and the workplace learning, and the face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, a huge number of learning outcomes were included in these trainings, about 600. Um, and uh, they were divided into the, the four profiles. 
Uh, the um, assessment of the learners was very high about uh, for, for this MOOC. Uh, they were very uh, satisfied. Um, of uh, about 80, 83% of them completed successfully the MOOC, and they were very satisfied of um, of what they saw, uh, the content and the the whole uh, training process. And I have to tell you that still the communities are active in the different countries. Already we had a meeting the other day. Uh, talking about uh, how we can continue with this effort. And to close this presentation, uh, MUSA is a unique example of combining uh, ECF with Digicom and transferable skills. That is why it has been included in the Digicom User Guide uh, as one of the best uh, practices. Uh, this is a publication of European Union. You can find more about the project uh, there. And this concludes my first presentation. And I would like to take another uh, three, four minutes to uh, show you uh, some of the projects we are currently running. Um, now, this is the DACE Research Group that uh, we are working for uh, in, the, in, the Hellenic, in Hellenic Open uh, University. And the mission of this group is to create technology to support the needs of their society. I skip the whole lot of this presentation to take you directly to the projects I want to talk to you about. This is one, for example, Roman Roots, that uh, aims to um, enhance entrepreneurship along the ancient Roman Roots. Uh, so the project works towards creating a map of the Roman Roots, uh, talking about the cultural heritage that relates to, to, this, uh, to the areas adjacent to the map, and then mapping the Roman Roots entrepreneurial potential and online creating online mini courses about entrepreneurship. Uh, the Musa project you just heard about. The Biblio project is a sister project to the Musa project and aims at enhancing the digital skills of librarians. It's already underway and now we are designing the MOOC uh, that will be developed um, and delivered in the context of this project. The approach is similar to the Musa project, uh, but the profiles, of course, are different. They are related to um, uh, people working in libraries. EU Heritage is another uh, similar project that addresses the skill shortages in cultural heritage sector, in particular in the field of heritage promotion, valorization, exploitation, mediation, and interpretation. We have already defined the skills, a set of skills needed for the cultural heritage se sector. We developed the, um, we are currently going to develop, and uh, we are now going to develop the occupational profiles and then again design and develop the training. Intour is a, a similar project, again, capacity development, but is addressed to accessible tourism. We had developed the two occupational profiles, and now we are working to develop the training. I'm skipping these projects, and this one is uh, uh, about uh, empowering uh, young people from disadvantaged background uh, to uh, help uh, young people to find digital skills, to find digital solutions in uh, um, so, uh, uh, societal issues through, academy, through hackathons, through academy laboratories. Uh, this is a project that relates to the digital valorization of cultural heritage. Silver, it's uh, now going to deliver the online training. Uh, we have ready the MOOC, we have developed the MOOC. And uh, finally, this is a project we are co uh, coordinating. Uh, it's about training archaeologists in use of uh, digital technologies during excavation and uh, in this way making the excavation part of the, of the training course in the university. I think I've said everything. This is where you can find more about our uh, research group and the projects we are running. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. And I hope you find this, uh, these things, uh, these projects interesting. Thank you. It was uh, really um, yeah. a great uh, overview of the things that can be done and that you are doing. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we will follow with the third speaker, Dr. Isabel Crespo from the European uh, Education. I hope that you can explain I, I've, I've looked in the web, but you better explain what, what it is, the European education and what it does. And um, she's um, uh, been working in designing hybrid spaces with cultural heritage. So Isabel, the, the floor is yours. Not the floor, now it's the screen, I'm sorry. 
Sorry for this uh, a little bit of mess. Uh, thank you very much, Alfredo, for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a bit the outsider. I'm not a professor. I'm, I don't have a PhD, but uh, I'm still really happy that you invited me to explain a bit what Europeana is and what we do in education. It's uh, starting to be a bit uh, complicated to, to define uh, what Europeana is and what we do. Uh, because we are widening our services and uh, tackling many different domains. Uh, but um, in, in, in short, uh, Europeana um, mission is to unlock uh, cultural digital uh, treasures, put them online uh, and make them available for everybody to enjoy either for research, education or creative industries. Uh, we are an initiative uh, funded and founded in 2008 by the European Commission. And um, we are mostly known for uh, developing, running this platform, Europeana.eu, where you can find over 50 million objects uh, drawn from galleries, libraries, museums, archives all over Europe in a huge array of, content, of uh, diversity formats. Uh, you can find videos, you can find images, sound uh, uh, recordings, uh, manuscripts, newspapers, uh, you name it. Uh, but most interestingly is that uh, 20 million of those uh, 50 uh, are uh, have open licenses and are uh, suitable for, for reuse, either for research or education. Um, these beautiful faces that you see here are uh, Europeana staff members. We are at around 60 people uh, from 20 different nationalities, uh, most of them coming from, the, from Europe, from the European Union, but also from other parts of the world. Europeana initiative core services are run by a foundation which is based in uh, in The Hague, the Netherlands. We are currently working uh, remotely as many of us, but uh, hopefully we can uh, meet soon in our offices. Europeana uh, foundation, Euro well, Europeana initiative and the Europeana platform wouldn't be possible without the contribution, of course, of a thousand of institutions uh, all over Europe. Um, ingesting and uh, integrating their data in our platform. We don't work with these 3,500 institutions individually, as you can imagine, because 60 people wouldn't, uh, uh, it wouldn't be feasible. But we do work with aggregators. Those are normally based uh, uh, nationally, in, uh, country, are country-based, and they work with their own cultural heritage institutions to, uh, to create this uh, workflow to ingest in Europeana. They also collaborate with us in uh, European uh, projects, our, our close uh, partners uh, to Europeana. Uh, those institutions, of course, are represented by individuals, uh, professionals who are uh, advocating to democratize the access to culture, to open up their collections, to make them available uh, in their own uh, platforms, but also in Europeana uh, website. Uh, we have currently more than 3,000 uh, members uh, in Europeana Network Association. Europeana is kind of a ecosystem. That's why it's getting a bit more complex uh, to describe Europeana because we have the initiative run by the foundation, but we also have those uh, professionals, volunteers uh, um, in a association, uh, and um, they. This is this is what motivates our. Uh, other, or our second main uh, uh, goal, objective, mission in Europeana, which is uh, help those professionals and those institutions in their digital uh, journey, digital transformation. Uh, to help them to that end, uh, we are um, offering uh, frameworks, guidelines, uh, um, case studies, best practices, capacity building, training webinars, all of those, uh, all these resources are free, open, and available in this other platform, pro.europeana.eu. And um, everybody is, uh, all these professionals are organizing special interest groups, communities, we, we call them, can be for communication, for impact, copyright, tech research, but also education. This is the community that I represent with other uh, STERI group members. Um, it's uh, free of charge to, to be part of this uh, association and uh, you can uh, uh, benefit, join, uh, enjoy many different um, uh, privileges, benefits uh, that you can, if you have your uh, 
phone, you can uh, scan the QR code and you can access directly to the form to take part of the association and see the different ways of uh, getting involved. It might be uh, knowing and participating in European projects, uh, know about uh, funding opportunities, um, meet your peers, like-minded people, but also have a say in the European Act governance. Uh, there's a members council and a members board uh, elections every uh, two, three years. Um, the mission of this uh, particular community of education uh, is a connect formal and informal education, is a strengthen the, the cultural heritage and educational sector. This is for obvious reason, but uh, it, it uh, uh, became uh, clear uh, since last summer. I, I, I should tell you that uh, Europeana was founded in 2008, but the initiative in education uh, has been running for three years, uh, over three years. So it's still young and we are learning and, 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 and doing things all the way. But last summer we had uh, several conversations with uh, professionals, uh, um, uh, in our network. Uh, the situation was quite uh, critical. Uh, everybody with uh, their doors closed, uh, trying to move their activities and operations overnight to the digital environment. So we decided to um, run a survey with NIMO. Uh, NIMO is the um, European Network of Museum Associations. And um, it was a, a survey especially addressed to museum educators, but open to other non-formal educators, uh, professionals. And uh, the idea or the main goal was to understand to what extent they had digitized their collection and uh, how they were using their digital assets for, for that purpose and also which were their training needs. The results are available uh, through this presentation. I hope you will get uh, access to, to it, to the complete uh, report, but uh, some results were quite um, enlightening and interesting. Uh, at around 70%, they had their collections digitized, which was quite an uh, interesting number, but they didn't necessarily use them for educational purposes. They mostly used those digital assets for creating virtual exhibitions or for their social media campaigns, but rarely to create lesson plans, lesson uh, learning material to engage with the schools and students online. Um, also, they declare uh, at around 80% that uh, they never receive any training to, uh, to operate online and almost 100% they were willing and eager uh, to receive this training. So all those uh, pro uh, uh, proposals that we hear from the speakers before are incredibly in need and uh, very timely uh, and necessary for, for those professionals. Uh, following up on uh, this survey, um, we organized a workshop at the end of summer uh, where we invited 50 teachers and 50 museum educators uh, to work together uh, in uh, different breakout sessions to do a SWOT analysis to understand how we could work together to create these hybrid spaces uh, with, to inform and inform education in the uh, digital environment. And we also offer a couple of uh, training sessions on Historiana, Transcribe, Athon. These are open online tools that we offer to uh, teachers, but also uh, non-formal uh, educators. Let me briefly explain you, let's see if I will have time and I will manage, but uh, these are basically the things have been uh, uh, doing and running the community of educators, uh, uh, of the community of uh, members, uh, associated members in Europeana, but I'll, uh, I would like to tell you what the Europeana staff members are doing in, in education. Our um, main goal is to promote the use of digital cultural uh, assets in formal and informal education. But as you can imagine, to scale the initiative quickly over the last two years, uh, we had to really focus on formal education. Um, to that end, we decided to create uh, partnerships with ministries of education, but also with associations and networks at the European level, like uh, European Schoolnet and Euroclear that I'll mention in a, in a second, but also with the industry, with those software developers, entrepreneurs, who are um, using our content to create a new innovative uh, pedagogical, pedagogical products and, and services. What we offer to them, um, Basically, great content, uh, content uh, provided by trusted sources, primary sources uh, in a, um, uh, from, uh, from arts and sciences. This is some of the cliches we are fighting uh, from the digital, from the cultural heritage institutions that uh, uh, digital cultural heritage is not just for uh, humanities, it's for STEAM disciplines as well. 
and uh, uh, a great diversity of content. It comes from uh, thousands of institutions, from the well-known institutions from the Rice Museum at Prado in Madrid, or to small institutions, Slovenia, uh, regional, uh, local museums. Um, and uh, in a, a, at least 37 uh, different European languages, not that the platform is, uh, and all the metadata is translated to these languages, it's uh, really uh, impossible uh, to, to succeed on that, but you can find every country, every uh, nationality is able still to find content in Europeana. Uh, one of our main partners, as, as I just mentioned, is European SchoolNet. This is uh, an initiative of the European Union as well to foster innovation in the classroom, in primary and secondary. Uh, this is a network of 37 ministries of education, and with them we have uh, organized a community of, uh, of teachers, European teachers, we name them. We have a group of ambassadors. We had last year 13, uh, 13 ambassadors representing different European countries, and every ambassador had 10 user group teachers. What uh, what they what have they done? Uh, they've created pedagogical material using European content, uh, digital cultural heritage content. Uh, we call them learning scenarios. They have helped us to um, spread the word about these resources uh, through webinars, promotional videos. But they also helped us uh, to design a massive uh, open online course. Uh, this year, uh, pushed a bit by the situation, by the um, uh, workshop, the survey, the collaboration with NEMO, we've um, decided to work also with museum educators uh, and also integrate other non-formal educators in, uh, in this group of, uh, of ambassadors. So now we have nine European teachers uh, representing uh, uh, different nationalities. We have three European uh, uh, museum ambassadors. And also we have um, uh, devoted a group for inclusion and diversity as uh, it turned out uh, quite an important topic uh, for us and, and, and for education. Uh, this is just an image of what is a learning a scenario. This is kind of a methodology by itself. It's a ready-to-use resource where we explain step-by-step step, uh, how to implement a lesson using digital assets, not just uh, digital uh, content from Europeana, but also digital tools. Uh, they are really well specified, all the learning goals, the, uh, the trend and the methodology uh, needs to go hand by hand, right? Uh, new content or digital content with new uh, innovative uh, pedagogies. So these are um, clear instructions on how to implement these uh, activities. We've designed a lot of, uh, of content. We have more than uh, now. I think we lost um, the contact with Isabel. I hope she can. Uh, no, 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 reconnect. Alfredo, you, your connection is uh, is uh, with problems. We hear Isabel fine. Yes. Oh, hello. Okay. So I'll I'll move on. Uh, just uh, let me know if something else happens. So we've been able to uh, upload. Uh, we have designed more than five hundred learning scenarios. We have uploaded five four hundred for now in the, a new space in Europeana.eu that is uh, especially. Uh, dedicated uh, to teachers and uh, educators. Um, uh, they are organized by age level, by uh, course curriculum subject, by language, and by trend of education, uh, project-based learning, inquiry-based science education, cultural language integrating uh, learning, so different uh, innovative pedagogies. Um, another uh, important piece of work with European SchoolNet is the development of this uh, massive uh, open online course. Uh, this is the third year that we are running uh, this uh, MOOC with uh, great improvements. Uh, this year uh, it's starting in on 15 March. And um, this is a MOOC designed by teachers or by educators uh, this, uh, in this occasion. Um, to help other educators uh, to integrate digital content uh, regardless the subject uh, they teach and the setting they use, eh? uh, being in the classroom, being uh, on distance or being in a museum uh, or a library environment. So this is, uh, I just wanted to show you a few numbers of uh, because uh, of previous uh, MOOCs uh, we are building in, in in the work success of uh, previous uh, editions. Uh, the previous MOOCs were mainly focused on, on compulsory education, on, on teachers. Uh, this has, uh, we are uh, 
shifting, uh, switching a bit our strategy now. But um, we always were the last uh, two MOOCs, we were at around 37, 40% completion rate, which is uh, above the 10% average of other MOOCs. So this gave us a bit of a sense uh, of uh, how the, the MOOC was uh, performing. But also a good sign for us was that at around always 90% of uh, participants felt more confident on using digital cultural heritage in their practice. Um, because the last year was quite successful. The second year uh, of, uh, of this MOOC, we decided to offer it in different European languages, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and Italian, uh, with uh, interesting uh, results uh, as well. Uh, these are just pictures of uh, uh, students implementing uh, some of these resources in the classroom as a proof that um, digital assets, uh, the perfect setting should be blended uh, education because now for the circumstances we are uh, pushing on the distance learning, but uh, we've been proving during the last two years that uh, um, it's uh, perfectly, uh, uh, it can be implemented into the classroom uh, as well. Um, I don't know if I can go on, but uh, if you give me five minutes more, I can go through another in interesting partner, which is Euroclio, which is the European Association of uh, uh, History Educators. Otherwise, let, uh, you let me know. Uh, with them, we have developed uh, a platform, uh, which name is Historiana. This is a virtual learning environment where uh, students and teachers, or also non-formal educators, can engage online. Um, in there, we offer source collections. Uh, these are mini collections of transnational historical, transnational relevance. In Europeana, we uh, skip a bit uh, the strategy of curricula-based uh, uh, material. We couldn't have, it's not feasible uh, to cover all the curricula in all the countries and all the age levels. So we are focusing on things that are transnational. Um, those uh, source collections uh, are uh, composed by 12, uh, minimum 12 items that are described by an historian. So it gives uh, a lot of context to educators to use it in their classroom. There are learning activities already um, attached uh, to those uh, source collections, but if still educators, teachers cannot find the learning activity they are uh, pursuing, they can uh, create their own one through the activity builder. This activity builder has also been designed uh, with uh, some rationale uh, behind, of course, um, mostly based on historical thinking. So every element, every building block is based on uh, an historical thinking element. For instance, um, cause and effect is possible to um, work uh, on through the discovery tool, but also we have highlighting a tool on textual uh, items where you can create annotations or comparison tool with different images. Um, uh, last but not least, uh, these are in a nutshell what we've been doing in education, but uh, another uh, important line of work in Europeana in the education initiative has been always to understand educators' needs and how we can meet those uh, needs with, uh, with the content and the uh, services cultural heritage institutions can provide. Uh, last year, um, there were uh, a couple of uh, interesting uh, programs and case studies that uh, I invite you to, to dive in and uh, have a look. One of them was uh, designed by Edo Clio, and the other one is a, more, um, is a program, two years, two year uh, program um, run in the Netherlands by Kennismet and the Network uh, Digital Hood. Um, just a few numbers of uh, some uh, impact uh, uh, indicators uh, uh, over the last two years. Um, and I think uh, this is it uh, for me. Uh, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, I hope it was more or less clear uh, what we offer and what we can do uh, in education. And very happy to answer any question uh, you may have. So I'm gonna stop uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's always uh, uh, motivating to see new initiatives that we don't know. This uh, European is something that I never heard of. Uh, I, I visit Barcelona a lot, uh, work a lot uh, with universities in Barcelona, but I never heard about it. So I, I would start with something that um, with you, and then I'll go to Achilles and to Diana. Um, the, the question is, I, I've seen that you are interested in maintaining these communities. Uh, online. How do you do that? 
Well, every community has very different dynamics. Uh, we have uh, basically with the support of the professionals and the volunteers behind. I mean, it wouldn't be possible if uh, those uh, without this uh, talent and uh, uh, willingness to uh, to support the sector. Uh, we have these different communities in Europeana because, as I mentioned, we have many different um, domains and we work for many different domains. And uh, to be honest, uh, uh, people, it's just uh, uh, amazing. They take their free time to contribute and, uh, and, uh, and to find solutions to problems that they are facing. Uh, uh, day by day, but uh, do this online. It, of course, it takes a lot of uh, energy, and uh, you have to be creative and imaginative uh, with the tools you have. So we try to meet regularly. We organize workshops. We are constantly doing events to keep people engaged and interested in what we do. We do a lot of effort also in social media. So there's a lot of uh, work behind uh, to keep engaged those communities. But uh, I would say that the one of the keys of success maybe is to really give them the floor, uh, let them participate, uh, have a say, uh, be really active uh, in what we do. Otherwise, uh, a very flat uh, conversation, it, it wouldn't uh, be useful or, or make sense. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, thank you for clarifying. I'll, I'll give the screen and the mic to Vlad, so he is going to make a question. Go yes, ahead, Vlad. thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Uh, my question is to all the speakers, and uh, we can start with Diana, for example. So I was telling at the beginning of this session about the struggles of creative industries, and I was also saying that one of the main, uh, one of the means of uh, reinventing this sector after the period of the pandemic is through digitalization. So my question is, how important is digitalization and uh, the improvement of digital competencies for uh, the cultural sector? Diana, if you could uh, uh, give uh, the first answer, please. Uh, I certainly believe it is very important. I think uh, mainly now it's even more important because this last year has proven that those even freelancer artists or cultural institutions or cultural, how to say, um, people or museums and galleries who had a cultural and digital um, interface were able to survive much easier. It was easier for them to go around and have a look at uh, what you can do with technology. But for this, as I always say in digitalization, you need three things. One is obviously to have the technology available. So you will need to have uh, infrastructure ready to go online. And, and it doesn't mean only a simple website or a mobile application. It will mean even more like augmented reality or virtual reality, virtual tours of your museum, of your gallery, of your artistic shop or explanation on how you paint or how you sculpture something or settings on how to broadcast an opera show or a, or a play uh, somehow virtually, that needs to be there. Then you need people who are aware on what they are doing and how they are doing it. For this, you need certainly digital competencies and digital competencies nowadays you can gain probably not so easy, but uh, still you can do, do it and do it for free. The Musa courses, the Europeana courses, the digital culture courses, which we launch and which are going to be also available, not only in English, but in six different languages like Romanian, Italian, uh, uh, how to say German, uh, Lithuanian. Uh, they are really helpful, you know, so they are really ready available and you just need to go and get them. So that's the thing which I always encourage them. And third, you will need really a vision. And for this, you need visionary people. And and one the examples which we gave today, they are just some examples which you can do with vision. Like we had a Spotlight Heritage and instead of doing a, a opening in situ in the Banat Museum, in the Historical Museum, we done it in different locations, on streets, uh, in the museum, live as a webinar, and it attracted thousands of people, and a lot of people seen that. Then the Yeta Museum, you know, we made it fully virtual. 
Nobody was able for a year to go there, okay? We make it virtually and people go and see it. And even more people were able to see it, people from other continents which can't do it. So with freelancers and institutions, digital is your way now. And I will strongly encourage you to mix. I would love to see plays and operas. I've seen some of them in the past, but even more are possible where images from Europeana, where images from other cities will be brought up with augmented and virtual reality, even for an in situ uh, location and, and, and show. So is that- Thank you. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> yes, I, I was looking for the button for the microphone. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see uh, if we have different opinions, maybe from Achilles, or if uh, he goes with the answer in, in the same line. Achilles, please. Uh, well, uh, in Musa, we took, um, let's say, a longer term uh, perspective. We adopted a longer term perspective. We didn't know that uh, the pandemic was coming uh, and the project finished actually before that. Well, actually, to when it was uh, starting. Um, and our research showed, uh, which was a long time research, actually, because we start, had started in a previous project. So it was a research we were doing for about three years, showed that uh, almost all profiles in the digital uh, in the cultural sector have to be augmented with digital competencies. This is what we try to do in Musa for a specific sector for specific profiles, and in the end we designed new profiles adding these digital competencies. So what what we we propose what we proposed and what proved to be very successful in practice, judging from the huge number of uh, registrations we had in the MOOC and for the great interest we have now after the end of the MOOC, and here I'll make a parenthesis to answer, to, to provide, to, to contribute to Alfredo's question, the previous question about the communities of practice. Uh, in Musa, we created a learning community of practice, a, a learning community, let's say, but then it it sustained itself. The community is now in the, in the, four, in the three participating countries because in Belgium, we only had a partner to, that did dissemination, but in the three main partner countries of the project, the communities are sustaining themselves now, either in Facebook or through Epale or in using other means they have found. And they are putting now back pressure on us to uh, deliver again the training. Uh, they liked it so much. So closing this, the success of the, of the trainings we offered uh, shows that uh, the, there is a huge need for, uh, is an, an important, there is a gap actually that we have to fill by adding these digital competencies. And now if I switch my hat from the MUSA coordinator and the university professor to the chair of the board of all digital, which is a international European network of uh, uh, organizations that offer uh, trainings on digital skills and the development of digital skills. Well, here we see many policy papers that have been uh, published lately by European uh, Commission that mention explicitly the need to develop digital skills in all the sectors uh, and the activities, the actions we have to do towards them. Uh, in all digital, we already host two European communities of practice with huge activity taking going on now. One is about the evolution of Digicom from version 2.1 to version 2.2. I'm saying this because Digicom was already mentioned in two of the three presentations here. And the second one is the community of practice that will lead towards this European digital skills certificate that is contained in the digital education action plan. And this should also be uh, of interest to the cultural sector and to every sector, actually. Uh, what does it mean and how these digital skills can be uh, associated with the different professions? And closing, we are also trying to influence the ESCO taxonomy of occupations and to add there the new uh, jobs the new that we have come, that we came up with, and also to add digital uh, competencies to the currently uh, existing, uh, existing uh, jobs. So in a nutshell, I think that uh, the pandemic just brought, uh, accelerated, brought forward this digital transformation of society, which is happening anyway, and we, which will affect all sectors. So I think we should invest in developing the digital competencies of all professionals, especially uh, the cultural professionals, as we have this big uh, area that's called digital cultural heritage. Thank you, Achilles. That's, those were very valid points and uh, I couldn't agree more. 
uh, I, I love to see that uh, uh, both you and Diana, uh, uh, how to say, highlighted the, the most important, the rel most relevant uh, benefits of uh, uh, using these digital competencies in the cultural sector and not, not only in, the, in this sector, as you mentioned, Achilles. Uh, Isabel, would you would you want to add some more uh, for this question, or do you do we move to another one? Well, I, I can just support what they said. Uh, I cannot agree more. Uh, on our own experience, um, we started focusing on uh, teachers because it was a, 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 a it was high in the agenda of the commission to really. Uh, promote this uh, digital transformation in education, but um, uh, museum uh, professionals or cultural heritage uh, professionals, they were a bit uh, uh, not aware about uh, the, the need of really doing this, this transformation uh, little by little. So the pandemic just came uh, as a surprise and everybody just uh, get uh, a bit uh, um, uh, naked, you know, uh, uh, and lacking resources and the way of uh, 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 moving and operate digitally. Um, just uh, uh, also in relation with Diana mentioned, um, uh, there's always this uh, worry that, look, we have to create new applications, we have to uh, do a lot and uh, a lot of ICT infrastructures, but there's already lots of uh, resources open out there that you can take advantage and uh, you can use for, for capacity building and training. Uh, this is something that we always try to to mention in presentations, like we don't have to start from scratch. Also, you have to think about the sustainability of the projects because sometimes uh, you have funding for creating a platform, but uh, nothing else. And uh, create content and create a platform and uh, create resources uh, needs this uh, Achilles uh, long-term uh, vision that he mentions, eh? because uh, otherwise it's also taxpayer money that, can, uh, that uh, we always uh, know uh, we can... Uh, uh, not take advantage or, or lose, or, but yeah, definitely I support uh, Achilles and Diana in their arguments. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, I would ask uh, one more question, if that's okay with you, to all of you. Um, we discussed more um, a lot about courses for individuals, and I think these courses address more the self-employed and uh, uh, people who uh, need a reconversion re of uh, their activities or want to improve their activities. But I don't, uh, I didn't hear, I, 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 heard, le I heard less speaking about um, courses or education for a whole organization. We have whole circuses who are just vanished because they cannot travel anymore. We have, we have uh, galleries, our galleries that cannot function anymore without people coming there. Uh, do you see something in the future in the in the uh, respect of education for such uh, organizations in the cultural sector? Any the, the question is open for any of the speakers, so uh, feel free to jump in. Um, I will start then, just to keep the same order, probably that easier. I will uh, probably I will suggest to go to the Musa course and I also ask Achilles in the name of the others uh, stakeholders to start again the course, even probably make it uh, uh, self-paced. So quite a lot of people to be able to join. But I see more of this as guides. You know, I, all, I believe a lot that if you give very simple structure guides on how to do things and deliver this to major stakeholders, is really helpful because quite a lot of them probably they've seen, they know, but they're just afraid of going and doing it because they, they are not aware what sort of technology you need, what sort of skills, how much time, how many resources you will need. And sometimes it's not that much. You don't need that many resources to be able to do it. A lot of them exist there. So this is why, you know, guidebooks are not books, but a simple guides and even infographics on, okay, do you want to do like to open your gallery for people? This is what you will need, this sort of cameras, this sort of, I don't know, 360s cameras and this platform and just go and do it. And probably simple things like that will help a lot of people in the near future. Let Thank me you, let me follow yes, up. Achilles, uh, please. Uh, because uh, I would like to thank Diana for uh, uh, for this request and t let tell you that um, because we received too many requests of that sort, we are now working on um, let's say on 
Uh, we are processing the Musa course and we are going to create a set of uh, micro courses that will lead to micro credentials based on the Musa course. I think this is going to be even more useful for those who will attend them. Uh, and this is uh, going to happen uh, this year, so you will hear from us again shortly. We are sorry that we've been away for one year, but the administrative burden of closing the project was too too big, too high. But now we are over that. This is finished. We got a really good mark and we are proceeding now with the next stages. Now, uh, in this project, we had foreseen the profile that was called Digital Strategy Manager, and I think this is what is needed uh, to be included in the cultural organizations. Uh, the pandemic came too quickly, and uh, most cultural organizations, organizations were not prepared for this, but uh, this is another indication that the digital strategy should be part of every cultural organization from now on. Uh, and of course, a plan to, to implement it because the strategy is, uh, is not enough. Um, so I would say that, yes, uh, we need organizational change, but how is this going to happen? Through people, by people, then it's not going to happen by itself. So again, we come back to training people, to making people aware, to enabling people, making them competent, to bring about the digital transformation in the organizations and also to sustain it because it's not enough to transform the organization. We have to sustain the new transformed organization. That's another challenge, perhaps more difficult than doing the transformation itself. Thank you, Achilles, for, for that uh, answer. Um, Isabel, would you like to uh, also jump in in this and then we are going to conclude the session? Yeah, yeah. Just again, uh, um, refer that you don't need big infrastructures to to go on with uh, uh, engaging with your audience at the educational level, for instance, or other areas. Because sometimes with just one item and a social media campaign, you can do you can do a lot. Uh, just as an example, uh, we organize um, a challenge in December, which was uh, named "Reinventing Beethoven." And the only thing that we did uh, is uh, to put together in a gallery and a couple of blogs uh, the material we had about Beethoven, that it wasn't too much because there were copyright issues, but those that were reusable, uh, we offer it to students and, and teachers, and we ask them to create new products, to make a video in TikTok, to uh, make us a song, to, uh, to write something, to draw uh, images about uh, Beethoven. And this was just... Um, finally shown in a padlet and uh, the students could uh, just vote. It was really easy, simple activity that it gained a lot of uh, attention and uh, available for any institution to just uh, uh, get inspiration and use it in, in their context. So a bit also, I would like to send this message that uh, it seems everything very complicated sometimes with all these uh, MOOCs, activities, resources, but just looking at other examples, uh, you can create uh, a lot of uh, digital activities for, for your audience and uh, at the educational level, which is uh, the domain uh, I'm uh, into it, of course. Thank you. Thank you so may, much, Isabel. May I jump in again and say yes, something because yes, I'm inspired please. from what Isabel just said. Uh, and I also am inspired from what Diana said in the beginning. She spoke about STEAM education. I think STEAM education should be taken very seriously into consideration because it's our vehicle to uh, invest in the future, to shape the future, let's say, to bring young people into this collective uh, way of uh, education that in which arts should play an important role. We are now coordinating projects about STEAM education and educators. We have created the competence profile of STEAM educators. We have established a community of STEAM, STEM and STEAM educators, but I have to tell you, I'm sorry, there are no policies about STEAM education. We didn't find in the, and Romania is one of the participating countries actually in this project. We didn't find policies in Europe about STEAM education. We find a lot about STEM, but not STEAM. The A is missing. We need to work to bring the A into the picture. Uh, it's important. So that's, let's say, another contribution I would like to make here for the, let's say, longer term future. Invest in the young people, bring them close. STEAM education can be a vehicle for that. Of course, hackathons and other activities that are more, let's say, appropriate for young people, but we shouldn't forget those who are now in the formal education that are going to join the uh, labor market in a few years. 
And imagine that this is only us engineers who are promoting this. So how it will be if we will be joined jointly by others, not only us engineers. So, um, you know, it's us coming. Uh, I know quite a lot of people say, what on earth are we doing, these computer scientists and engineers in, in culture and art? We love culture and art. And we know that creativity needs culture and art and and beautiful things in our lives. And we want to, to help that. Not only going to Mars counts, but that's important, but even in Mars, they brought designs with them and iconographics. Thank you all. This, uh, this uh, helps me conclude that the future sounds good after hearing so many uh, good examples and study cases and seeing the, the passion with, with which all of you are speaking. I can come back to what I said at the beginning, that there is an opportunity after this pandemic finishes for the cultural sector to reimmerse and to, to, to be stronger than, uh, than it was before. I don't want to finish until uh, I remind you all that uh, during uh, Eden's Open Education Week webinar series, we still have two more days. And uh, I think uh, I'm going to be helped with, uh, with uh, uh, some slides, yes. So, uh, okay. Today also we have the Eden chat session on Twitter. After this session ends, uh, use the look for the Eden chat um, hashtag, and you will uh, you can join uh, some interactive question session for half an hour. Uh, tomorrow we are going to have uh, um, another webinar starting at one CET with the topic insights from an internationally co-developed MOOC on digital citizenship. Very interesting topic moderated by. Uh, Timothy Reed on behalf of uh, Eden EC. And on uh, Friday, we are going to have uh, another webinar. Okay, uh, I, I don't have it <laughs> now, but I think uh, our colleagues already uh, posted uh, from the Secretariat the link in the chat uh, uh, for the whole uh, uh, week uh, uh, events. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I want to uh, remind you all that you are all invited to uh, the Eden uh, virtual annual conference, which was supposed to happen in Madrid. Uh, because of these times, this also moved to uh, the online, but uh, we saw that uh, virtual conferences have their benefits and we hope you can all uh, participate and uh, share your work and uh, research there. I want to thank uh, our distinguished speakers for uh, this session. It was very refreshing to hear uh, something a little bit more different and uh, creative uh, from uh, from this point of view. And thank you also to uh, my uh, co-moderator, Alfredo, for uh, joining this session and for all of you attending. Have a good evening and see you on, on Twitter for the Eden chat. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you bye. very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.